Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, coronavirus disease 2019, or COVID-19, is all we're really hearing about on the media, local and national. And my guest today wrote in an article in Mises Wire that crises of all kinds, whether they're economic, political, military, or health, send ideologues scrambling to explain how such events fit neatly into their worldview. In fact, he says, political partisans often attempt to paint any crisis as having occurred in the first place precisely because their policies and preferences have not been adopted. So joining me today to take a look at how politicians and bureaucrats take advantage of crises like coronavirus disease 2019 is Jeff Deist. Mr. Deist is the president of the Mises Institute. Hi, Jeff, and welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much, Robert. This is a fascinating topic. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, well, not too many years ago, we all remember Rahm Emanuel saying, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that is it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. So as I stated in the intro from your article, the various crises that politicians uh they give politicians a chance to increase their power, which should concern um, everybody. Can you elaborate on this? Sure. It's human nature, I think. That's the nature of governments and of states is to want to boss everybody around and corral everybody and run their lives and, and perhaps most importantly, get us all accustomed to looking to government officials as the people to, uh, to whom we should uh, get information from, whom we should get information, or look up to, or listen to, or rely upon in a crisis. And I think that's a very dangerous mindset because they don't know anything more than we do. I mean, if we look at uh, organizations like the CDC, which is obviously part of the U.S. federal government, if we look at you know, supranational organizations like the World Health Organization, uh, I mean, their records are very mixed. You might get better advice from your local pediatrician. You might get better advice from some kooky website you visit. You know, it's all depends on hindsight. So I don't like the idea that when something like this happens and we don't necessarily know fully the origin of this outbreak, but when, when something like this does happen that we all have to sort of drop everything and await our masters in D.C. to make a pronouncement. I, I don't like that mentality. I don't think that's an American mentality. I think it's something we should resist. And I think if we look back at other uh, seminal events, whether those were at other infectious diseases like SARS or swine flu or avian flu or whatever, or events like 9-11 or even Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, oftentimes if we let some time elapse, Time and space gives us a very different perspective on events a week later, a month later, six months or a year later. And and so we ought to be careful about uh, how we react. We ought to be careful about what powers we allow government to assume because of, of this or any other crisis. And I, I think it's just we have an obligation, Robert, to be reflective when the Internet and social media are pushing us to be reactive, and, and sometimes there's an element where this is it's, it's our own fault. Okay, are you really seeing that right now with this COVID-19 issue? Well, we're certainly seeing the politicization of it because, uh, you know, Democrats want to sort of blame this on the feckless Trump administration. The Trump administration wants to blame it on the Chinese <laughs> just to have a bellicosity uh, you know, sort of, sort of the next element of our trade war, which I had to look, not only do we need a trade war with these guys, we can't even let them come over here because they've all got some disease, you know. So as I mentioned in the article you referenced, we, we like to have world events fit into our existing worldview, even if they don't, right? It's natural. We, most of us have some sort of ideological perspective with regard to politics or or a general worldview, and we want to say, oh, my gosh, those Chinese are terrible, and look, this just proves that we that everyone needs to be vaccinated, or this proves that nobody should be vaccinated, or this proves that we need a really robust public health uh, apparatus in this country because, my God, we're all just vulnerable to this stuff, or it proves the opposite. Look, even in a country as authoritarian as China, where they can just seize people and lock them down and force them into treatment 
even there they can't seem to contain this thing. So what, you know, what, why be authoritarian? So you can really use this to fit a, a variety of narratives. And that's, that's something as liberty loving people I think we should be cautious of. Narratives are, are, are what we make them. And whereas reality is objective. So, uh, I, I'd like to see more reality and less narrative. Where I happen to live in Auburn, Alabama. The office from which I speak to you today is located right across the street from the Auburn University Stadium in a vast campus of 30,000 kids. And a lot of uh, foreign students come and go. Uh, and they're, I think, talking about potentially suspending, uh, you know, live classes for perhaps a period here we're we're just in the middle of a semester i mean is that is that an overreaction i guess i i i would say yes but i'll i'm interested in what you think is that an overreaction what what is what would your audience think yeah that's a good question um we've been seeing that in countries around the world and i think up in seattle now too so um we'll see what the outcome is um i mean there's a lot of research out there that talks about things like travel bans and and other types of uh, situations that we don't there's really no data to support that they're really effective and I've interviewed people on that in the past too so it's a good question but I mean I think it makes the public feel better right right and that might be a lot of what's really at stake here yeah well one of the things that I really attracted me to your article was the title and it's very, 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 very spooky title and uh, says, does the coronavirus make the case for a one world government? What do you mean by that? Well, we have a world now where globalism in terms of trade, travel, migration is, is a reality. Uh, travel has never been cheaper uh, in real terms, inflation adjusted and, you know, global trade has probably never been more robust and so the world has shrunk, and things that happen in China, for example, in the Wuhan province, affect us in a way that they certainly would not have 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and that's just a fact. So the question becomes, since we're all sort of in this together, and that goes to trade and politics and war and infectious disease and all these other things, you know, gee whiz, we can't have all these national governments operating independently of one another and just uh, forwarding their own interests. We need to have some sort of supranational organization coordinating all this. And people suggest this with respect to central banks. They want a, a global central bank under the IMF. They uh, project this with re respect to infectious diseases. They want the WHO to be the de facto uh, public health boss. For, for the entire world, um, they reflect this in in military treaties like NATO. They want one organization coordinating defense for you know many many countries. So this is really the trend of the 20th century: is this centralization of political power from local to regional to state to national, and now increasingly to international or supranational. And I think something like the coronavirus where you say, well, look, Jeff, you know, you're this crazy libertarian and you want everything totally free, but what happens when an infectious disease comes along and we can't trust the Chinese? So what we need is some sort of global body or global government to come along and say, okay, no flights from this country to that, and we're going to coordinate the creation of a vaccine, an antiviral drug for this, and we're going to tell this country, uh, you know, it can't ship anything out. And we're going to tell this country it has to quarantine people. And be, because that we, we live in a global world, we have to have an overarching body running all of this. And honestly, that's a pretty good argument to a lot of people's ears. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's a global world, that really is a challenge to the libertarian worldview. Let's be fair here. Um, and, and that's a powerful one. I, I would argue it's a bad one and a dangerous one, but I understand the appeal. No, no, I, I'm with you on that. And, and we're halfway there already, as you mentioned, a bunch of these uh, the alphabet soup agencies. However, right now, the World Health Organization is not telling countries about quarantine. Each individual country is doing their own thing. But you're saying possibly in the future. 
Sure. I, I, unfortunately, that, that's been the trend of the 20th and now 21st century is, yeah. is centralization of political power. And, and the irony here is that virtually every other facet of life is becoming more and more decentralized in a variety of ways. Uh, but uh, go- government tends to expand, consolidate. That, that's its nature. And there are plenty of people, um, the, you know, the euphemism is the Davos crowd, right? Mm-hmm. There are plenty of people who uh, would like to see one set of rules for the world and, and to eliminate the nation state as the primary uh, form of governance and also as the primary primary source of, let's say, loyalty or patriotism. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't consider myself a nationalist because that term has nation state. I think the nation has lost out to the state and the states won that. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, where we are today, I think nationalists and statists sort of uh, go hand in hand. But I do... I do think that human beings are, are different and, ha- and, and ought to be uh, governed to the extent they must be by rules and practices that are decided as close to home as they possibly can be. That's, that's my less than magic uh, approach to how the government ought to work. And, and so uh, when something like the coronavirus comes along, I think people who feel the opposite uh, from me uh, get get a real boost. Well, you did you did touch on uh, a term about vaccine vaccines uh, uh, briefly uh, earlier, and that's really brings me into my next question, and that's probably the one issue um, that you discussed in the piece that you and I do not really see eye to eye. And this is what you state: um, no individual should be forced to consider herd immunity or other collectivist notions when making medical decisions. So. So, Jeff, I guess my question is, how do you maintain public health against vaccine-preventable diseases without considering herd immunity? Well, I mean, first of all, for effective vaccines, I think everyone should go get one, <laughs> right? I mean, No, I'm, I'm not um, saying you're anti-vaccine, but... Yeah, yeah, and, and just like everyone should wear a seatbelt. Um, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, and, and to, you know, I was laying out the, the hardcore libertarian perspective here. And the libertarian perspective, no one for, should be required to. In most people's perspective, they should. So the question becomes, how do you maintain public health? Well, I think a, a couple, a couple of answers to that. How do you maintain them under the current system? Not flawlessly, uh, not perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, and beyond that, I, I think sometimes you rub up against competing and conflicting values and uh it, if most people get vaccines i think that's a good thing but I, would i would i support a law that literally requires let's say a scoff law set of parents to have their kid taken from them and held down and administered a vaccine in order for that kid to let's say go to public school mm-hmm. um no, my answer to that is no. I just think that's too intimate, uh, too you know that sort of immediate bodily autonomy is not something the state ought to violate. Does that mean that Jeff's Jeff World would would have worse public health? Maybe I'm not entirely convinced because I I think a lot of I I think in hindsight we find out that a decentralized approach where people try different things uh, oftentimes works better than. Uh, one, let's say, down the middle vaccine that's supposed to work against most strains of flu but can't work against all, uh, um, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking for better, not perfect. And I think regardless of your political worldview, I think you ought to say, you know, maybe I just don't have an answer. I would I would rather have a society that's a little more dangerous from a public health perspective than a society where a kid is held down and administer a shot against his will or his parents' will. That that's a yeah. trade off and I I'm not smart enough to say I have the the, the solution to that trade off. No, I get that. And I and I think the answer would people would respond, at least people in the public health community would be, well, what about those kids that have some kind of condition where they can't get vaccinated? Your your kid who you choose not to vaccinate could infect my child and possibly a life threatening infection. Right. Um, so I guess the the short answer is, is 
you know, maybe those people need to be separated um, yeah. physically. And I'm not I'm not one for public schools anyway. So yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if if my kid were were kept out of public schools, I wouldn't be so sad. But there's a lot of people who who believe in public schools and who don't necessarily have or want to spend money on on private schools or homeschooling. And so they 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 would be in a bind. Um, but you know, I, I also feel like these same questions ought to be posed to people who believe in big government. I mean, these are we we can call these lifeboat scenarios. You can call these trolley scenarios where you have to choose which trolley track uh, the trolley is going to go and then kill some people. You know, um, so it's 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 really a question of compared to what. Uh, I don't I don't think a a world with less government would be perfect. I do suspect it would be healthier and wealthier. And that alone, I think, would do wonders for public health because a lot of, let's say, China's problems is just that it's pretty poor on a per capita basis. And so it's it's sanitation, uh, the proximity to animals, all kinds of things uh, are just worse in poorer countries. I mean, the, the short answer to how do you in, in improve public health, I think, is have your society get richer. That's first and foremost. Yeah. And you and you really kind of touched on quite a few things. And my uh, next question is, toward the end of your article, you made some important points concerning a question like, um, so how do you reconcile public health with individual rights? And should the latter be sacrificed to protect the former? Can you kind of briefly go over those points? Well, it's it's a it's a question in any society. What do you force people to do for the good of the collective? versus what you allow them to do just purely for self-interest. And, uh, you know, in, in, the, in an Internet world you're, where everybody can sort of tailor the information they consume to their own biases, and we all do it. Let, let's be honest here. We, do, we all do it to an extent at least. Um, you know, 50 years ago, uh, something that was, that in my opinion, it was clearly beneficial, like a polio vaccine. I don't think you had parents 50 years ago saying, oh, I don't know, i got to look into this and research it because this might have mercury in it or this might cause my kid to have a seizure or something, so I'm going to I'm gonna go home and research it. I mean, the Internet has made this sort of mentality, I think, a lot more prevalent. And so even in places like China where the Internet is restricted and controlled, there, there's – you know, there's the possibility of sort of pirate servers and people getting information and comparing notes across national boundaries about how the governments treat them. And so, I, man, it just seems like it's going to be awfully hard going forward to not have some some holdouts, some people who have, whether crazy or not, um, you know, read some information that makes them not want to do something from a public health perspective. So. And all of this goes to the general fracturing of our country, the, the political divide. Um, we're, we're suspicious of each other. And so whichever side is viewed as controlling the state apparatus, uh, you know, a lot of people hate Trump and hate the Trump administration. So no matter what it would, might do uh, via the CDC or otherwise on this coronavirus, they're going to be either saying it's incompetent or evil. And so are people going – are people's political biases, let's say, going to filter down and subtly influence their decision on, let's say, uh, a, a vaccine or treatment that Trump administration people came out with? I don't know. It's, it's a tough question. And, and to me, the best answer is localism, subsidiarity, federalism, even secession – uh, potentially in the future. I think that's, that's the, that's the best way to ease all these tensions. The coronavirus isn't the source of the tension. It's exposing the tension. Mm -hmm. And you really, you really believe that, and I, and I believe in, in, in to a certain extent that, uh, market incentives and decentralization is really the answer. Well, or I think answer. the market is, it, I think the market is always fastest and nimblest. I mean, if you start to look at coronavirus and you said, let's say its death rate uh, was much higher as a percentage, and let's say it was affecting people across the board rather than uh, obviously having a, a, a higher degree of impact on, let's say, older people, people with impaired immune systems, uh, infants, that sort of thing. Let's say it just struck everybody and it was 25% uh, you know, fatality. 
then I think the market would rush to a vaccine or a treatment that maybe wasn't proven, maybe wasn't approved, might have some of its own dangers, but compared to, oh my gosh, I'm going to catch this form of flu that's particularly nasty and I got a 25% chance of dying. I mean, you know, I, I think the market would be the place to make that, for people to make that decision faster than, as opposed to having the government say, well, wait a minute, we got to test this, we got to approve it, we got to, we got to decide whether it's safe. A lot of people say, screw that. I don't care whether it's safe. I know this coronavirus is, is deadly, so give it to me. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I, I think the market is, is faster there, and I think that the way you regulate that is through tort law and suing pe- people for harms uh, rather than this sclerotic regulatory state that's not only slow – it causes a bunch of people to get killed by being slow, but also gets captured by industry, uh, pharmaceutical companies, etc., and, and oftentimes just becomes political. Oh, very good. Uh, um, thank you, Jeff Deist, for sharing your thoughts with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate you asking me to, to join the show.